اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ومن احسن قولا من من دعای اللہ وعمل صالحا وقال انہ من المسلمین رب شلی صدری ویسلی امری وحل العقدت من لسانی حفظ کا وقولی I welcome all of you I welcome all the viewers of the Peach TV Network the Peach TV English the Peach TV Urdu the Peach TV Bangla the Peach TV Chinese as well as my social media platforms which are the Facebook the YouTube, the Instagram, and the Twitter, as well as the Alida platform. I welcome all the viewers with their Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I welcome you to this program, Ask Dr. Zakir, Season 11, Session 2. You are most welcome to ask any question on Islam and comparative religion, or any question which a non-Muslim may have asked and you are unable to reply, or any question you find in the media regarding Islam, this will be the opportunity. You're most welcome to ask any question on any of the social media platform, but the best would be to ask on the WhatsApp as a WhatsApp message, mentioning your question in brief, along with your name, your profession, and the city, to the WhatsApp number plus six zero double one two one double three double three six zero. I repeat, plus six zero double one two one double three double three six zero. We go ahead, we start the session with taking a question from the WhatsApp. The first question, Assalamu alaikum sir, wa alaikum assalam. I am Momin from Kashmir, I am a student. I want to know that if feces are formed in our body continuously, then we are impure all the time. Where will I get the answer? But the moment from Kashmir asked the question that if feces are found that are formed in the body all the time, then are we not impure all the time? So what is the reply to this question? What is the meaning of the word feces? Feces is excreta and it is made up of 75% water and 25% solid. And from the solid, 30% of the solid is the dead bacteria. 30% of the solid is the undigested food, for example, cellulose. 10 to 20% is the cholesterol and 10 to 20% are the organic substance like calcium, phosphate, etc. And 2 to 3% are protein. But basically, how are the feces formed? The food that we take, it goes into the stomach. From the stomach, it goes into the small intestine. Small from the small intestine, it goes into the large intestine, then goes into the rectum, and all the food, the, 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 the ingredients, what's required for the body is digested, is required, and the waste material is collected into the rectum. Now, as far as what is impure, the feces, the excreta, according to Islam, is impure when it comes out of the body. Excreta means when the feces comes out of the body, is najis, it is najis, it is impure, it's a minor impurity. But when it's in the body, it is not impure because the thing we eat is the food, it goes into the stomach, it is pure, it goes into the small intestine, it is pure, the large intestine, the rectum, only when it comes out, then it is najis. And let me give you an example. We all of us know, all the Muslims know that alcohol is prohibited. Alcohol means intoxicants and we know intoxicants are made from various food stuff including grapes but the grape we have is halal but when the grape is fermented and when it becomes converted into an intoxicant it becomes haram so the grape per se is halal only after it is fermented and after it starts intoxicating it becomes haram Similarly, the food that we eat is pure. The food stuff that is there in the stomach is pure. When it goes into the intestine, it's being absorbed, the food in, uh, nutrients. Then the dead bacteria is there, the waste material is there, go into the rectum. When it comes out, that is najis. What comes out? So only when the excreta comes out, only when the feces comes out, it's najis. Only when it comes out, it starts smelling. When it's inside your body, it doesn't smell. So only when it comes out, it becomes just like the moment 
the grape juice becomes fermented and it becomes into an intoxicant, it becomes haram. So similarly, you should be very clear that once it comes out of the body, it becomes najis. And we have to clean it when we go for call of nature, we wash it and that's it. But in the body, it's not najis. This question normally comes in the mind of the human being as a vaswasa from the shaitan. The shaitan gives vaswasa trying you to deviate you and puts these questions into your mind. But I hope it's clarified now that only when it comes out of the body, it's called excreta. It's excreta of the body. Similarly with the urine. Similarly, when the wind which you pass out, inside the body no problem, outside it's najis and then you have to purify yourself. Hope that answers the question. My name is Yusuf, country Kuwait, profession accountant. My question is, what is the correct way or steps of asking Allah for forgiveness for both minor and major sins? As far as asking for forgiveness there are mainly five points which are important if you do a sin especially a major sin repenting to allah is a must otherwise the sin will not be forgiven and there are five criteria for repentance to be accepted by allah the number one criteria is that you agree what you're doing is wrong the sin that you're doing agree it is wrong number two you stop it immediately Number three, you repent to Allah. You ask Allah for forgiveness. Number four, you do not commit it again. See to it, you never do it again. And number five, if you can undo it, for example, if you can repay, if you can compensate for it, for example, if you have stolen some goods from some person, then it's your duty that you have to return it. If there is no chance of undoing it, it's a different way. But if you if there is a chance or opportunity, if it can be undone, it should be undone. So basically, these five criteria are required for repentance to be accepted. Number one, agree it is wrong. Number two, you stop it immediately. Number three, you ask Allah for forgiveness. Number four, you do not repeat it again. And number five, if you can undo it or if you can give back the thing you have stolen or done some harm, if you can undo it, you should undo it. And there are various verses in the Quran and the Hadith talking about repentance and talking about that Allah is of forgiving in most souls. There are umpteen number of verses and Hadith. I'll just quote a few. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 39, that those who have committed a crime, if they repent and they change their behavior and do righteous deed, Allah will forgive them. Allah is of forgiving, most merciful. This verse of the Quran is immediately after Surah Maida chapter 5 verse 38 where Allah says, as to the thief, be it a man or a woman, chop off his or hand. The next verse says that if they repent and if they ask for forgiveness, then Allah is of forgiving, most merciful. Allah repeats the message in Surah Anam chapter number 6 verse number 54. He says that, O oh you who believe, if you do a sin in ignorance, you repent soon after that. Allah is of forgiving and most merciful. Allah says in Surah Tahreem, chapter number 66, verse number 8, that if the person sins and he asks for forgiveness, you hope that your Lord, he will forgive you and he will put you into garden, into Jannah, below, below which streams and rivers flow. <clears throat> Allah says in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 17 and 18, that Allah accepts the repentance of the person who does the sin in ignorance and repents soon after that. Allah is of forgiving and most merciful. But Allah does not accept the repentance of a person who continuously does sin until the hour of death. And when the hour of death approaches, he says that, please forgive me. Allah will not accept this repentance. And those who die rejecting faith, for them, there is a severe punishment. Allah says in Surah Anfal, chapter number 8, verse number 38, as for the unbelievers, if they go away from their unbelief, that means if they give up the kufr and they accept Islam, 
Allah will forgive all the past sins. That is the reason when a person accepts Islam, all his previous sins, however grave they are, they are washed away and Allah forgives them. And Allah says in Surah Azab, chapter number 39, verse number 53, that tell to my servants that despair not the mercy of Allah. However much great sins you do, despair not the mercy of Allah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran in several places that Allah is of forgiving and most merciful. And there are several hadith. Allah says that uh, Abu Lawid Prophet said, it's mentioned in Sahih Muslim in hadith number uh, 2759 that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives the sin at night of his servants who have sinned the whole day. And Allah forgives the sin in day of his servants who have sinned the whole night. The Prophet peace be upon him said in Sahih Muslim, hadith number 758, that during the last one third of night, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descends to the lower heaven. And there is one hour during the last one third of the night where Allah asks, is there anyone who wants his sin to be forgiven? Or does any of my servants want anything? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives the sin of his servant. So the best time during the full day to ask for forgiveness or to do to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the last one third of night. And if you can in, in your qiyam, in your qiyamul layl, in your tahajjud salah, if you ask Allah for forgiveness in your sujood, that is the best time. So if you fulfill these five criteria of repentance, inshallah, Allah will forgive your sins. The next question, Dr. Zakir Naik, my name is Muhammad Mohsin, I'm from Pakistan. My question is that I am married and living with my parents and I'm jobless. I have gold above 85 grams and a year has passed to the marriage. Is zakat obligatory on me? If a person possesses any saving, any wealth above the nisab level, 85 grams of gold, then once one lunar, one lunar year has passed, it is further that he should give 2.5% of that saving every lunar year. So since you have that 85 grams of gold, more than 85 grams of gold, for more than one year, it's obligatory you should give zakat, that is 2.5% on that saving, irrespective whether they're jobless or not. Since you have that saving for more than a year, then you should pay zakat on it. Next question. Abdurrahman Ashraf, profession, computer science student, location Lahore, Pakistan. Suppose I am working on building up such websites where there will be beer, adult site or any other religious activity posted in the future. Is income that I derive from developing such websites, will it be halal? Note, I will only code for that particular website. It's up to client whether he will use it for right reason or not. Kindly guide me, Jazakallah khair. The question posed by the brother is that if he makes a website or just the basic platform, and if someone uses that platform for selling beer, or for wrong site, or for other religion, for other religious purpose, so will he be responsible for that? Let me make it very clear that, for example, if you make a glass exclusively for selling, for drinking alcohol, then making such a, manufacturing such a glass or selling such a glass in which exclusively it's made for drinking alcohol, it's prohibited. But if you make a normal glass in which normal people are supposed to have water or cold drink or juices, and if someone uses that glass, for drinking alcohol, you're not responsible. So similarly, as far as making a website, if you design a website which is exclusively meant for haram products like alcohol or pork or, or for wrong sites or for other religions, then it is haram. But if you make a basic platform, like there are many platforms available today in the market, we make a platform and you sell it and that person can on that develop any website or any platform which he wants then making such a basic platform is permitted. But if you design a platform 
which contains things which are haram, like selling alcohol or selling pork, or it may be for a bank, the conventional bank, all this is haram. But if you make a generic platform on which someone can buy and develop the way he wants, then you're not liable and it's permitted and the income from that is haram. Next question. My name is Saklain Mushtaq. I'm from India. I am a store manager by profession. To get a job, can I make fake documents? Suppose I'm not a student of ITI and I require the certificate of ITI to do the job. ITI, the full form is Indian uh, Institute of Technology, Indian Institute of Technology, to do the job. Is it permissible in Islam? Kindly clarify. Making any fake documents or making documents such that which is required for a job and you make a fake document so that you acquire the job, it's totally haram. It's not permitted for you to fake a document because that means you are misguiding the company you're working or the boss you're working for that you're a specialist in IT, which you're not, or that you're qualified and you have a degree, which you're not. So this will come under cheating and it is totally prohibited. Next question from the WhatsApp. Assalamu alaikum. I am Ilma, a student from India. Is there any difference between the namaz, that is salah, of a man and a woman? And any reference from hadith? Jazakallah khair. As far as the method of offering salah for a man and woman in Islam, there is no difference. Generally, all the commandments in Islam, when it is given, it's for both men and women, unless there is a specific instruction for that. Or unless there is specifically mentioned it's for male or it's for female. And the Prophet mentioned it's hadith of Bukhari. The Prophet said, pray as you see me pray. So here the hadith is very clear cut. It's both for men and women. So the prayer as far as for the man and woman is concerned, it is the same. Whether it is qiyam, ruku, sujood, whether it is standing, bowing, prostration, sitting, it is the same. There is no difference. There are a few points which is maybe associated with salah, for example, the aura for the man in salah, the minimum requirement that he should cover from navel to the knees. For the woman, the complete body should be covered except the face can be seen. And there's a hadith of beloved Prophet that the woman should wear the khimar, the head covering, and the complete body should be covered, the only part that can be seen are the face. As far as adhan and akama is concerned, it is the man who gives the azan and akama. The woman, since they should not raise their voice, they don't give akama as well as the azan. A woman can lead the salah if it's only of a woman gathering. If it's only a woman's congregation, she can lead the salah. But when she leads the salah, she does not stand ahead. She stands in the first row, in the center of the first row. Whereas if a gent is leading a congregation, he stands ahead. And the first line starts behind him, behind him. If a woman is the imam of a woman's gathering, when she is the imam, she stands in the center of the first line. And she stands same as the people standing in the first line. And if she decides the Quran, she should be careful that there are no namiram who are hearing when she decides the Quran aloud, whether it's the Fajr prayer or it's the Maghrib or the Isha Salah. Uh, as far as when she goes in ruku and sujood, her limbs should be close to her body so that uh, she keeps close to the aura and, and uh, she maintains it. So that these are the minor things that are associated, but as far as the actions of Salah are concerned, where she keeps, where she, she keeps the hand, as the man keeps left hand over the right hand, and uh, it should be on the chest, and the ruku, the sujood, everything is the same, because the Prophet said pray, as you see me pray, it's Hadith of Sayyid Bukhari. Come to answer the question. Muhammad Saimun Sahariyar from Dhaka, Bangladesh. I am an electrical engineer and also a student working in a power plant. I have a question. If I stand up from sitting position 
as my boss or teacher enters the room for showing him respect, is it a sin according to Islam? Then what to do if it is haram? Regarding is it permissible to stand up for your boss or teacher when he enters? Is it haram? Before we dwell into the main question, let us understand that it's standing up for someone. When someone comes, is it, is it permitted? And there are various hadith and each hadith depending upon the circumstances. There are various hadith which shows it is impermissible. For example, the Prophet peace be upon him said, it's in Imam Ahmad, hadith of uh, uh, Sunan Abu Dawud as well as of Nisai. It's the Sahih hadith that the Prophet said that if a person who wants others to stand up for him, he books a seat in the hell. That means the person who desires that other people should stand up for him, he books for him a seat in the hell. And the Prophet once, when he comes out and leans on a stick, and when the companions stand up, he says that, why are you behaving like the non-Arabs who adulate or venerate a person. So the Prophet got angry when they stood up for him. And, and once when the Prophet was leading the Salah, he was not feeling well. So he was sitting and leading the Salah. And when the Sahabas behind him, when they stood, he indicated to them that sit down. That means when he is sitting, he does not like the other people to stand up. So all these hadith show the impermissibility of standing. But there are other hadith which shows otherwise. There are hadith of Hadith Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, who said that I have not seen anyone as resembling close to the Prophet of Allah, like his daughter Fatima. And whenever Fatima, when she came, the Prophet stood for her and made her sit where he was sitting. Similarly, when the Prophet went to meet Fatima, may Allah be pleased with her, she stood up for the Prophet and she made him sit where she was sitting. So here it shows it is mustahab. It is sunnah to stand for the person who you love. Maybe a family member. And then there's a hadith also that when the Bune Quraida, when Banu Quraida, when Saad may Allah be peace with him, was coming to give the judgment, he came on a donkey and the Prophet told the people of Banu Quraida that stand up your leader has come. So here the Prophet commands them, tells them to, to stand up. Here it shows it is preferred, it's encouraged to stand when your leader comes. And there are hadith, so these hadith, the second third hadith come to know that here if you love someone or you revere someone, maybe a family member standing is good or see your leader coming, there's no problem. So depending upon the situation, so based on this, there are various rulings and Sheikh Islam ibn Taymiyyah has written very well that depending upon the niyyah and the situation, the opinion or the verdict will change. Number one, if you are standing up for someone who is a family member, like your parents, because you love them, because you respect them, or your children, it is encouraged, it is mustahab, it is sunnah. Or, like we see in the hadith that the Prophet stood up for Fatima, my life believes with her, and she stood up for the Prophet. It's encouraged, it's mustahab. There may be a situation where you are standing up for a leader who you respect. In the hadith of the Prophet told when Saad, my life believes with him, came, when he came to the people of Banu Qareda, he told them to stand up. So if someone who's knowledgeable, or someone who's leader, or someone who is approaching, for respect if you stand, it is encouraged, it is mustahab, depending upon the situation. But in all these situations, these people don't desire that someone should stand for them. It's out of love that you're standing for your parents, for your children, out of respect you're standing, it's different. Or if someone is coming into your home and you're welcoming them, and when you stand to welcome them or shake hands with them, it is permissible to stand up. In this situation, the person coming is standing and you are standing up to receive him, it's permitted. 
And it's common in the Arab culture when you go to the Gulf countries and, and if there's a majlis, if some guest comes, everyone stands up. And the guest shakes hands with everyone one by one. So if you're standing to welcome him and shake hands with him, it is permitted. There's no problem. Now coming to a situation where someone desires that they should stand up when he comes, this is not permitted. And the Prophet said, he will be in the hell. A person who desires that someone stands up for him. Or, like we find at the times of the Persian kings, that they were sitting and the others were standing. So if someone is sitting and the other people stand out of respect while he's sitting, this is not permitted. And that is the reason when the Prophet was leading Salah, he was not feeling well, he was sitting and reading. He told the other people, the Sabas who were praying behind him, in congregation, he indicated to them, sit down. That means we should not behave like those people, the kings of Persia, who are venerated. So in such situation, now coming to the basic question, that when a teacher or a boss comes, again, if the boss or the teacher wants that you should stand up when they come, then you standing up for them is not permitted. But if you love your teacher because of the knowledge he has and, and the ilm he has, and you stand up just to welcome him and you shake hands, etc., or wish him, this is permitted. It's no problem. So depending upon the intention and depending upon the situation, it is the verdict changes. Hope that answers the question. From the YouTube, Abdur Rahman Yusuf. Abdur Rahman from America, full time student. Are UFC video games haram since they don't cover their chest and thighs and strike the head? As far as playing video games, if the video games do not break any rule of the Sharia, it's permitted to play the games. But most of the games they do break the Sharia because of the music they have, because of the images they have. But if, it, if it's compliant to the Sharia, it's permitted. As far as the UFC games are concerned, Amrit Abdurrahman has asked, that because the thighs are seen and the chest is seen, the chest doesn't come in the aura for a man. It's preferable to cover it, but the aura is from the navel to the knee. So if the shorts they're wearing is coming above the knee, then that is not permitted. And again, in UFC, in the, in the fighting, or MMA, mixed martial arts, you strike the face. And the Prophet said, you should not strike the face. So striking at the face of the opponent is not permitted. So watching a game which involves, if you're, if you're watching judo, no problem. Because in judo, the dress is very well, the, the judo dress, the way covers the full body. In fact, it's above the ankle, it's more of a sunnah. And there is close contact, there is no striking on the face, there is throwing of a person. So judo per se is good. Whether you do judo or you watch judo, no problem. But UFC, the ultimate fight championship, where it is MMA, mixed martial arts, where you are allowed, and most of the time they punch, or you get the maximum points when you punch on the face and punching on the face is private in Islam so playing such game is not permitted in Islam question from YouTube R.A. Akash I have a question as a Muslim can I use websites like chat GPT can I use chat GPT using chat GPT per se is no problem as long as you don't involve haram things in it like Google you get good things and bad things you can learn many things, you can search for the Quran, for the Hadith, you can search for wrong things also on the Google. So similar chat, G, chat GPT somewhat like Google. So using per se is not haram, but using it for haram things is haram. And we have to realize that chat GPT is a new artificial intelligence technology that has come and is going to grow. So we Muslims cannot be away from it, but you should know how we should utilize it. Sometimes it may be good, sometimes it may be bad, it may take a person closer to Allah and Islam, it may take a person away from Allah and Islam. And you know today we have social media. There is more haram on the social media, but yet you can use the social media for good purpose also. So as a Muslim, we should train to use the advancement of technology for the good purpose, for your benefit. And there is a very good video that was released recently by One Path Network from Australia and it interviewed a person by the name of Dr. Walid. Dr. Walid who is an expert 
in artificial intelligence and he has made uh, Google involved in development of Google Maps and Uber etc. And it's a very good interview of about 20 minutes. If time permits, you should watch and it says what is the new development of AI, artificial intelligence and how, how you should benefit from it, how you should be careful about it. And so Muslims should make use of technology but see to it that they stay on the straight path and utilize it for the good purpose and not for wrong purpose. Hope that answers the question. The next question. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Muhammad Yaseen from India. I am a project manager in a software company. My question is, can we rent a home with high deposit? Example, regular rent is 1 lakh advance and 15,000 rent. Can I rent it for 10 lakh advance, that is 1 million rupees advance, and pay only a rent of 5,000 rupees a month? Please advise, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect you from all the harms and troubles are mean. This is a question posed by Muhammad Yasin from India and it's a common practice in India and certain countries like Pakistan etc. where if you pay a heavy deposit then the rent becomes less. That means, and you give an example that normal deposit is 1 lakh rupees that is 100,000 rupees and the rent he pays is 15,000 per month. But if he pays 10 lakh, that is 1 million rupees, the rent from 15,000 goes down to 5,000. So is it permitted? So now what you are doing, you are paying 9 lakh rupees or 900,000 rupees more and this is called as deposit or loan or whatever you say. And because of this, instead of 15,000 rupees, he is paying 5,000 rupees. So in short, you are giving 900,000 rupees as loan to the owner of the house and in that you are getting a favor that he is taking 10,000 rupees less for you per month. That means instead of paying 1 lakh rupees, you are paying 10 lakh rupees. Instead of paying 100,000 rupees, you are paying uh, 1 million rupees. That means you are paying 9 million rupees more as a deposit or you can call it as a loan. Of course, that landlord or the owner, he will not keep it in a locker, he will use it. That means they are giving him as loan. And in repayment or in lieu of that, you instead of paying 15,000 rupees per month, you are paying 5,000 rupees per month. That means you are giving him a loan of 900,000 rupees and you are paying 10,000 rupees less to him per month. This is nothing but riba. In Islam, if you give a loan, and you derive certain benefit from that loan, it is called as Raba. So this is not permitted. You are permitted to give a deposit. For example, if the rental is about 15,000 rupees and you say that I am giving two months rent as deposit. That deposit may be security if you leave so that and you extra, if, if you stay extra, then he may deduct from that or if you call damage to the house, you can deduct. This is as a secure deposit, which is normally supposed to be kept separate. Or you can give a check, that if I delay, you can encash the check. Or the money given is kept separate, only as a deposit is permitted, but giving a large amount, which the owner of that house will utilize, it is called as a loan. And in lieu of this loan, if you derive any benefit, it's called as riba. So if you are giving loan to the owner of the house and in and there are cases where people say okay you take give me a large amount of money you give me five million rupees take my house don't give me rent after two three years you want to leave you give the house back i'll give you the money back now if you're giving loan to someone if you're giving loan to someone and in lieu of that loan you're utilizing the house you're getting some benefit that's called as riba you're utilizing a house which may be worth about 20,000 rupees a month or 30, whatever it is. So if you give a loan and in lieu of that you derive any benefit, it's called as riba. It's not permitted. Yes, you can buy the house and utilize it and then again he buys it back, that's permitted. But giving just a deposit or a loan which utilizes the money and you don't pay rent and you keep on utilizing, 
and then when you want to go give it back to you, this is riba. You can buy the house if you want, full money. And then if when, once you leave, you sell it back to him at the same amount, make a contract, that's accepted. Then you can utilize the money because that money is his. Because he sold the house. But keeping as a deposit and making a contract that I'm giving a large amount of deposit, which is counted as a loan, and in, and in lieu of that, I will not charge any rent. This is riba and this is not permitted. Hope that's the question. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I am Taha Amanat from Pakistan. I want to ask for a book, Izarul Haq, which I want to read to gain some information. Thank you. Regarding the book Izarul Haq, this book Izarul Haq was the book that changed the life of Sheikh Ahmed Didad, the person who changed my life. You know that I was, I was inspired by Sheikh Ahmed Didad and it's because of him that I changed from a doctor of a body to a doctor of a soul. And if you read the biography or if you know the history of Sheikh Ahmed Didad, Sheikh Ahmed Didad was born in India. At a young age, he goes to, to South Africa. He only studied to standard six. He was working as a salesman in a furniture shop. And there, in South Africa, the Christian missionaries, they used to harass the Muslims. And they used to attack the Muslims, quoting the Quran, and asking the questions from the Quran. And a lay or a common Muslim is not aware of it. So once Sheikh Ahmed Didad, he comes across a book by the name of Izar al-Haq, which answered to the questions posed by Christian missionary. So this book, Izar al-Haq, was written by Maulana Rahmatullah Karanvi, originally in Arabic, in 1864. In the 19th century, Maulana Rahmatullah Karanvi from India, he writes this book, Izar al-Haq, in Arabic. It's in six volumes. And basically, it replied to the attacks of Christian missionaries against Islam. It mainly dealt with Christianity, that how did the Christian missionaries attack Muslims, how did they quote the Quran to misguide the Muslims, they quoted the Hadith. So this full book mainly is in reply to how to reply to the Christian missionaries who come and convert, who try to convert the Muslims to Christianity. And it's also a reply to a book by Karl Fender. Karl Fender was one of the most famous and well-known Christian missionary in the world of his time. In 19th century, he was the most famous Christian missionary to convert Muslims to Christianity. And Karl Fender was deputed to India, to Delhi and Agra, and he wrote a book, Mizan al Haq. So in reply to even this book, Mawlana Rahmatullah Karanvi, he wrote the book Izar al-Haq, replying to him as well as the other allegations and the techniques of the Christian missionary trying to convert Muslims. And there was a debate that took place in the 19th century. And Paul, this uh, Karl Fender, he was very famous and very eloquent in debating the Muslims. And whenever he used to debate, he used to win. So it was Mawlana Rahmatullah Karanvi who debated with, with him and he won the debate and if you hear the talks of Sheikh Ahmed Didad he has given a few a few incidences of the debate in the debate in one of the debates Karl Fender Karl Fender while debating so a person comes and whispers in the ear of Maulana Ramatullah Karanvi and Maulana Ramatullah Karanvi, his face becomes very sad. And he's very sad. So Karl Fender asks him, Maulana Sahib, what's the problem? Maulana is very sad. Why are you so sad? He said, my secretary just came and told me that Archangel Gabriel died. So Karl Fender tried to laugh. He said, isn't it foolish? Do angels die? So Mawlana Ahmadullah Karanvi said, for you when God can die, 
in 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 Christianity, if God can die, why can't angels die? So it was a battle of wits. So like that, there are many incidences which is told by Sheikh Ahmed Didad in his talks. I'll just narrate one more incident that during the debate, Carl Fender, he asked Maulana Sahib. So Maulana Sahib, when, when the battle of Karbala was taking place, where was your prophet? Peace be upon him. Maulana Sahib did the, the prophet. He had died during that time. So, so Carl Fender, maybe he was sitting, he was close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, yes. He said, then when the battle takes place and when the enemy slay his grandson, Hussein, in the battlefield, where was the Prophet? So Manas said, the Prophet was in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Manas has asked him, so then Paul Fender, Carl Fender asked him that why didn't your prophet, Muhammad, peace be upon him, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to save his grandsons. So the Mawlana Sahib was silent. Then Carl Fender again insist, why didn't your prophet, Muhammad, peace be upon him, tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to save his grandsons when they were being killed? So the Mawlana Sahib is silent. And Carl Fender gets restless. Come on, Mawlana Sahib, why don't you reply? Why didn't your prophet... Muhammad peace be upon him, ask your Allah to save his grandsons. So Mawlana Sahib cried and he said that Allah replied, when I cannot save my own son, how will I save your grandson? So these debates are battle of wits. So Mawlana Ahmadullah Karanvi, he gives them a taste of their own medicine. And when they say that Jesus Christ supposed to be son of God, he died. So Almighty God replied, when I cannot save my own son, how will I save your grandson? So these type of replies are witty replies. It is normally when someone gives an illogical argument to you, says 2 plus 2 is equal to 5, and he's not willing to listen. So what do you do? You say, okay, here take 200,000 rupees, 200,000 rupees, and give me 500,000 rupees. Or take $200,000, $200,000, now give me $500,000. And the man will say no. So sometimes you have to agree with the false argument and win the battle. Like in judo, when you're doing martial arts, when someone tries and pushes you, you take a side step and use his force to throw him over. So this is mainly a, a technique of debating, which Muhammadullah Karanvi, mashallah, was an expert. And so was Sheikh Ahmed Tidad. So this book, Izarul Haq, was written by Malana Rahmatullah Kharanvi in 1864, originally in Arabic in six volumes. And later on it was translated into English. It was summarized and summarized in three volumes and translated into English, Urdu, Persian and other languages. The Urdu translation was done by Malana Akbar Ali Khan and the preface was written by Mufti Taqwi Usmani. And later on, Muhammadullah Karanvi he goes to Makkah and he was also appointed as a khatib in Makkah. He used to give lecture in Makkah. And then he formed a madrasa, which is even today existing, called as Madrasa Saulatia. And even I've been there. It's a madrasa, you know, where he used to train the people how to reply. And in this book, Izarul Haq, he used the arguments of the earlier polemics, like a tabri, uh, 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 Ibn Hazm, Sheikh al-Islam, Ibn Taymiyyah. So he used the argument and you know that the Ibn Hazm and Sheikh al-Islam, Ibn Taymiyyah, they were expert. And Sheikh al-Islam, if you read his books on Christianity, they are excellent. The way his argument against the Christian missionary is excellent. So Izar ul Haq, in that you find Muhammad Allah Karanvi has picked up many of their stuff and he added in his book. That's the reason his book is, mashallah, very good. And for a dai, especially who wants to dawa to the Christian missionary, this book should be read. You can surely Google and you'll find the English translation or the Urdu translation. It's available in India and Pakistan and other, it's also available in UK and other countries. So this book is Arul Haq, 
in English language it's in three volumes. The name is The Truth Revealed from the YouTube Rahat Rahman. Assalamu alaikum sir, wa alaikum salam. Sir, I study in a co-school where my seat is fixed with a girl. What should I do? I can't leave that school. What should I do? The brother Rahat Khan has asked a question that he studies in a co-ed school and his seat is fixed with a girl. What should he do? We have to first try and find out what is the age of this boy Rahat Khan. If he is young, very young, below the age of 12, then there is Ruksa that if he is in the pre-primary section or the primary section, then it may be permissible in a co-ed school, though it's not advisable. It may be makhru, but permissible. If it's in the secondary school after standard 6, where the, where the age is above 13, 14, 15, then it's not permitted. If he is in the pre-primary or the primary, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, where the age is up to 9, 10, then it's fine. It's permissible, though not encouraged. But it's always preferable that for a Muslim, a boy should study in a boy's school and a girl should study in a girl's school. In having COVID in the pre-primary is permitted, to a certain extent, lower level of primary also fine. But the, up to pre-primary, it is safe. After that, avoiding is the best. But in secondary, it's totally prohibited. So if you have gone into secondary school, if you are in the pre-primary or primary, there is no problem. If you have entered the secondary school, where you have become an adult, then it's not permitted for you to sit next to a girl. What you have to do is you have to change your school and see to it you join a school which is only for men. Hope that answers the question. There's a question from Facebook by Khan Arif. Can you please tell me about why Allah accepts repentance? A man who worships for Allah in whole life and a man who denies to worship will be in the same category after repentance. So the question asked by Brother Khan Arif, isn't it illogical that a man who worshipped Allah for the full life and there's a man who doesn't worship Allah, he does seek his full life and towards the end of his life he repents. So will they be on the same level, isn't it illogical? What you have to understand that if there's a person who has understood the deen and from day one is a Muslim. He knows about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he worships him throughout his life. Whereas the other person who is doing shirk and does not worship Allah and towards the end of his life he accepts Islam and he repents. The problem is in the first case the person who understands Allah is at an advantage. No one knows when a person is going to die, how long he is going to live. The other person who is doing shirk maybe till the age of 50, 60. Now how does he know that he is going to survive till the age of 50 or 60? So if, for me, of course, the person who worships Allah the full life is, of course, more safer bet. That's a different question. That at the age of 60, the person accepts Islam. Now once he accepts Islam, all his previous sins are washed away. Now this person who is doing Ibadah, if he has done Ibadah, his Ibadah is positive. He has not done any sin. So you cannot say that both will be on the same level. A person who worships Allah with Ikhlas and Khulus, with Taqwa, his full life, he is, been, he is getting many positive points. So at the age of 60, if he is worshipping Allah, maybe most of his life after he became an adult, the other person is, being, is sinning and at the age of 60 he accepts Islam. At that given time, yes, the person who accepts Islam is sinless. But the person who has been worshipping Allah for the last 50 to 60 years is at an advantage. Because besides he not committing sin, he is on a higher level because he has worshipped Allah. And a person who worships Allah, he always asks for forgiveness. And a beloved Prophet Muhammad he says in a hadith 
that he is to ask forgiveness minimum 70 times a day. So, if the mushrik is being forgiven, even the person who is an abid, a person who is doing ibadah, even he has been forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because however much good human being you are, they are bound to be you will commit some of the other sins. So this nature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of forgiving most merciful is beneficial for everyone. Now just because somebody else Allah puts in Jannah, Allah is not at all taking anything away from you. So when you are worshipping Allah, there is bound to be you may be doing certain minor sins or certain sins even though you are worshipping him. And, and you as a good Abid, you may be asking for forgiveness. So Allah even forgives you. So it's benefit for both. It's not only one-sided. And just because somebody else also is put into Jannah by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why should you feel bad? You should be bothered as long as you are put in Jannah. If Allah says, okay, fine, I'll not forgive both. Our Prophet said, no human being can enter Jannah only because of his deeds. So the Sahaba said, what about you Prophet? He said, even I. Means even the Prophet, if he has to enter Jannah only because of his deeds, he cannot. The best exemplary human being in the world, he says, we can only enter Jannah by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Only if Allah wants and Allah forgives you, if Allah is Rahman or Rahim. So that means, you fail to realize that besides forgiving that non-Muslim who are doing shirk the full life, Allah forgives them, Allah is also forgiving you. Because you know human being only on his deed can enter Jannah. It has to be with the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the nature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He being of forgiving, most merciful. Hope that's the question. From the Facebook. Shahabdeen Muhammad Safreen. My name is Muhammad Safreen. I am currently living in Sri Lanka. The minority Muslim people are suffering continuously in my country. No one has any voice for them. You know the situation of Muslims living in Sri Lanka. What do you want to say to the Muslims in Sri Lanka now? There was a question that there is a lot of atrocities done to the Muslims who are minority in Sri Lanka. So what is my advice to them? Number one advice, and I'm aware that in the last few years there has been many atrocities done on the Muslims of Sri Lanka being a minority. And there were the government that was the previous government did do a lot of atrocities like how the Indian government is doing today on the Muslims of India. Similarly, the previous government of Sri Lanka did a lot of atrocities. And you saw to it that Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has his way. Allah says in Surah Imran chapter 3 verse 54, Makaru makar Allah, Allah khairul makarim. They plan and plotted, Allah to plan. Allah is the best of planner. The president of Sri Lanka, who did atrocities on the Muslims a couple of years ago, when he was in power, what happened later on? The same person, he is being attacked by his own people. And we heard in the news last year, that the Sri Lankan entered his house and they attacked the house, they ransacked the house, they were after his life. He had to run away. He ran away to Thailand. Then, then he went to Singapore, he kept on and all the countries refused him. So much so that he was not given asylum in any country, he had to come back to Sri Lanka. So now that government which did atrocities on the Muslims are out of power. And another, <laughs> there is another president now who is much more passionate or much his behavior towards the Muslim is better than the previous president. So Allah has, has his plans. He is the best of planner. As far as the Muslims are concerned, it is the duty of the Muslims that they should see to it that they follow the basic faraiz. Irrespective of what the situation is, whether they are living in Sri Lanka or they are living in India and if there are atrocities, then you should see to it that you are following your basic, your following your basic faraiz, that are you on tawheed or not, see to it that you are praying five times a day in the mosque, in congregation, see to it that you are giving zakat, see to it that you are fasting in the month of Ramadan, if Allah has given you the health and the wealth, you should do hajj. You do all these things which are fard, 
and abstain from things which are haram. First, see to it that abstain from things which are major sins and then even abstain from things which are minor. And we should always have faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This life is a test for the hereafter. Allah says in Surah Mulk, chapter number 6 and verse number 2, Allah zi khalaqal mawta wal hayata. It's Allah who has created death and life to test which of his good and deeds. So this life is the test for the hereafter. Allah is testing us that do you follow his commandments? And if there are hardships, do you yet follow it or not? So this is the test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we are living and we should see to it that we stick to the Quran and Sunnah. We read the Quran, we read the Quran understanding and see to it that the Muslims are united. One very important factor for the Muslims, especially if living in a minority country, in a country in which they are minority, that they should be united. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 103, Wa wa la Hold to the rope of Allah strongly and be not divided. We Muslims should hold to the rope of Allah, that is the glorious Quran and the Sahih Hadith, and be not divided. Hope that answers the question. My name is Bin Mahir Hassan. I am a student from Kenya, Mombasa. My question is, can a girl stroke a woman post her picture in the social media? As far as posting pictures of girls and women on the social media, I personally, there are two groups of uh, opinion. The one which is lenient, they say that as long as the girl is in hijab, she is completely covered, she is wearing a scarf, her hair is not seen, it's permitted. But the more correct opinion is that posting a photograph of a girl or a woman, even if she is in hijab on the social media, is not permitted. Because when you post, you know, there are people who say it's no problem, you can post on the social media, Facebook, and keep it private and only give access to the ladies to, to become your friends. This is very difficult. And even if hypothetically it's possible that you only give access to females, and if you post your photograph on it, that photograph will be seen by the other female, and that female may show it to a brother, may show it to a father, may show it to a boyfriend. So, your photo will be exposed to the Namaram. So I'm of the opinion and I agree with those group of scholars who say that posting photograph of a female with hijab or without hijab both are prohibited on the social media because the social media is a public domain. With all the restrictions that you have, it's a public domain. Even if you allow only females to be your followers, even if you do that, the other female, how do you know that they are as strict as you or not? So that's the reason I don't even encourage that women should take photographs with other female friends. Well, when they take photographs and if they allow their friends to keep their photographs, their friends, there are high chances, may show it to their brother, may show it to their father, may show it to their boy relatives, and the hijab will be broken. Because normally, uh, Islam, it's very clear cut. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 30 and 31, that say to the believing man that he should over his case. And verse number 31 says, of Surah Nur, chapter 24, say to the believing woman that she should lower her gaze and guard her modesty. So, Allah says in the Quran, for, for the man, that when he sees any woman, if any brazen thought comes, he should lower his gaze. So in photograph, even if the woman, if the female is in hijab, looking at a photograph is not permitted. The Prophet said that the first glance is forgiven, the second is prohibited. So on this view, I believe that the women who make use of the social media, they can surely see to it that they don't indulge in anything which is against the Sharia and should be particular that they should not put the photographs. They can have text messages, they can have other scenery, they can have other things. But they should see to it that they don't put their photographs on the social media because surely it will break the hijab and it would, it would, they would be getting the sin for allowing the photograph to be seen by the other Namir Rammi. Hope that answers the question. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa barakatuh. My brother in Islam, Dr. Zakir Naik. 
Indra from Jakarta, Indonesia. Which is better, doing dawa alone or to join a dawa organization? Question one. Question two. What's your opinion about tabligh jama? About jama tabligh? Can we join it for dawa? And the third question. Why does Dr. Zakir Naik not join other dawa organizations? As far as the first question is concerned, what is better, doing dawa alone or doing dawa by joining a dawa organization? The answer is, whichever is more beneficial, whichever way you can do more dawa, that's better. But generally, doing dawa by joining a dawa organization is more beneficial. Because you do it collectively, you do it in a jama. There's more barka and it's more effective. Now, when you're doing dawa in an organization, it is properly structured. You have many people in it, maybe tens, hundreds, thousands, depending upon the organization you join. It is more structured. You have people to help you, the people to correct you. You can help other people. So always doing dawa through an organization is multiple times bene beneficial than doing individually. There may be certain situation where individually, you may have certain things or some ideas which no other DAO organization have and you have certain skills. So in this case, if you feel that you have certain skills and you want something unique, your technique, etc., then, then you start an organization. If you think that you are something unique. And I always say that when someone starts a Muslim organization, Islamic organization, see to it that that organization is doing things which are first as per the Quran and Sunnah number one. Secondly, see to it that don't reinvent the wheel. If everyone is doing the same thing, what is the benefit? See to it that you do things which are unique and do it with quality. Number one should be as per the Quran and Sunnah. Number two, see it is unique. Number three, see to it that it is the best. Then you have a unique organization which is the best in the world. So always doing dawa in organization is beneficial as compared to individually. But today, because the whole world is a global village, and you can do dawa through social media, through the internet, on the Facebook, on the Instagram, on the YouTube, and there are various channels. So nowadays, of course, doing dawa on individual level is also possible. But if you join an organization, that organization may train you. It may be more effective. You can do in a collaboration, you can do together with your friends, you can be more effective. But you can do alone also. So depending upon the situation, depending upon how much time is at your disposal, depending upon what is your work profile, all these pros and cons, whichever, for example, you don't go into a DAO organization is very far away from your house and traveling takes one hour, coming back is one hour and you will waste more of time. Then in such situation, if you think you can do individually better, no problem. But see to it that you associate yourself with the organization. If you can't go daily, you go once a week or go once a month. Associating with it is beneficial so that it can, you can be more effective. As far as the second question is concerned, what is your opinion about Jamaat Tablik? Can we join it for Dawa? As far as Tablik Jamaat is concerned, Alhamdulillah, it is one of the organizations of the Ellison Naval Jamaat. And you know every organization has got pros and cons. On a whole, as a whole, not looking at the minor mistakes, it is a good organization. As I said, every organization has got pros and cons. They have got plus points and negative points. Tablik Jamaat is basically not an organization that is focusing on the non-Muslims. They are mainly focusing on the Muslims. What they are doing is not tabligh. Tabligh mainly means dawa, giving the message to the non-Muslim. What they actually do is Islam. Islam means to improve, to repair, to correct. And they are doing it. They are doing an excellent job. And they make sharabi kababi into namazi. They go door to door, they keep on knocking, and they see to it. They tell the Muslim, why don't you come to the mosque? Why don't you offer salah? Why don't you fast? So, as far as Islam is concerned, they are doing an excellent job. And it is one of the largest Muslim organization in the world. They are not so much 
for media but yet the network is very good even though they are not so much involved in media but the network is good and the conferences they have the gathering they have is in large number it's in thousands tens of thousands hundreds of thousands even millions they are very good one of the major drawbacks as far as i am concerned is that they give importance to a book called as tablik and nisab a book tablik nisab or it called as fazail amal so in india and pakistan and these people of course they are on quran they are on sunna but in the circles in the durus they study more of this book than quran sunna but not that they don't follow quran sunna they follow quran sunna and in this book there are many stories etc some and there are hadiths which are zayif so this is a drawback but the tablik jamaat in the gulf country they read riyadh salih so this is good riyadh salih is a wonderful book it's a wonderful book of hadith and every muslim whom besides the quran should have this book also so in the gulf country the tablik jamaat focus more on riyadh salih but in india pakistan bangladesh they focus more on tablik e nisab or known as fazail e amal so this is a drawback otherwise the organization is doing good work it from the ls unnawal jamaat and i'm aware that one of the gulf country has called them you know and called them as organization involved in terrorism and that time i give my worry that by no way by no way is the tablik jamaat involved in terrorism there may be one or two members who have done something wrong so you cannot blame the organization because of one or two members so as a whole tablik jamaat is from is from the al sunnah wal jamaat and as a whole they are doing good work mashallah and regarding a question that can we join for dawa as i said the tablik jamaat is more involved in islam not in dawa though there are certain people for example maulana kalim siddiqui he is a tablighi from tablighi jamaat and he is very well versed in dawa among the non muslims he's from india but basically tablighi jamaat is more for isra not for dawa and the third question in the same question why does dr zakir not join other dawa organizations as far as joining other dawa organizations concerned as you may be aware that after being inspired by sheik ahmed didad in bombay we started our own organization by the name of islamic research foundation and alhamdulillah we started in 1991 when i was doing my internship and alhamdulillah we started with one employee and we grew mashallah it became in the next few years in the next 10 15 years mashallah it became one of the largest Muslim private dawa organization in the world, where we had more than 500 full-time paid employees only in Bombay, and a couple of hundred in other parts of the world. And it was the largest private Muslim dawa organization. Alhamdulillah, Allah blessed it so much so that we were so effective that, mashallah, thousands of non-Muslims accepting Islam in India. So much so that that the Indian government, after Modi came to power, started laying allegations. and started the allegation that they involved in terrorism then they wrote a letter to the interpol and they refused it then they changed the allegation from terrorism to hate speech again the interpol refused then they changed it to money laundering so because of this in 2016 at the hijra so to say that why don't i join other organizations i myself i'm involved in many organization i am i was the president of islamic research foundation now the government has banned it even the irf educational trust when where there were schools but most of the organization that i was actively involved i was the main person involved as a main trustee you can call it the president or you can call the main person involved so that i could do at my own free will you know i am a person who is very strict as for the quran and sunna as far as other organization is concerned alhamdulillah i personally cooperate with most of the leading dawa organization in the world as far as the dawa organization that concerned in the world alhamdulillah summa alhamdulillah 
I am in touch with most of the leading DAO organization in the world from different parts of the world, whether it be America, UK, Europe, Australia, Africa, Alhamdulillah. So much so that, mashallah, I am in touch with the heads of most of the popular mainstream DAO organization in the world from different countries. And what we used to do that when we had the conference, we had the, mashallah, one of the largest Islamic conference in the world. And we used to call people from all different organizations. And I believe except for those Muslim organizations which were involved in too much of bidat and shirk that we have turned from. As a whole, always believe, as Allah says in the Quran in Surah Imran, chapter 3, verse number 103, Wa tasimu bi Hold to the rope of Allah strongly and be not divided. The rope of Allah is the glorious Quran and the Sahih Hadith. So, we used to cooperate with all, as many Muslim Dawah organizations as possible. Except those Muslim organizations who were involved in too much of bidat and shirk, we used to stay away from. Otherwise, and when we had conferences, we used to call the main speakers from all the organizations. When we started having conference in 2007, 8, 9, 10, 11, so we had for 5 years, it became so popular. So in India, we used to call people from different organizations. We used to call from, from Deoband, we used to call from Nadwa, from Jamaat Islam, me, from Ali Hadith, the Hanafi, the Shafi, the Salafi, and we have one platform. And we give a platform to all so that we collaborate and we work together. We may have our small differences, but we collaborate together and we are united. So always, whenever you have an organization or see to it that you cooperate with the other Muslim Dawa organization so that you can be more effective. So this has been a policy and, and yes, we had a policy of, of collaborating and supporting various Dawa organizations, not only with, with techniques, with materials, even financially. And we saw to it that those organizations that were involved in Dawa, when we started a satellite channel, Peace TV, of course, we started collaborating with all the Islamic satellite channels, whether it be in English language, whether it be in Urdu language, as long as they were not involved in, in Bidat and Shirk, that was the only criteria. We supported them with whatever we can, with our technology, with our knowledge, and with even finance. So whether it be Dawa channels, satellite channels, whether it be Dawa organization, whether it be Dawa institutions, whether it be individual dais, at all levels, we used to collaborate and we do that even now, even though we have left India, we did Hijra about seven years back. Even now, mashallah, we are in touch with most of the Duat and most of the Islamic organization and we try and support him and help each other. Hope that answers the question. <coughs> there is another question from Muhammad Akhtar Khan from London, UK. I have noticed that most of the English Dawah talks organized by Muslims in the Western world and other parts have an entry ticket. But all your talks throughout the world, including the ones with very large audiences, never have an entry ticket. According to you, is it better to charge an entry fee which will help in covering the expenses of the program or better keep it free? This is a very important question asked by Mamad Khan from London, UK. And since I come from India, when I started Dawa after Mindy Sheikh Ahmed Didad and started the organization in 1991, at that time in India, in the eastern part of the world, charging ticket for any Islamic lecture was unheard of. The first time I went out on a foreign trip for giving lectures, of course, in 1994 I went to Mid Sheikh Didat and 95 in Jeddah, but in 96 when I started going to the Western world, I'd gone to Canada in 1996 and I was shocked that they were charging five dollars, they were charging ten dollars per ticket and I'd gone on a lecture tour with other Duats and then I had a lecture tour of UK in the 90s and other parts of the Western world and I was shocked 
that they were charging empty ticket of five dollar, ten dollar, fifteen dollar, twenty dollar, depending upon the event. And I was not comfortable with it. So much so that after a few years, maybe in 2002, 2003, maybe 20 years ago, I made it a policy that anyone who invited me for a talk, I have to mention there while accepting the invitation. Number one, I will bear my own, I will bear the cost of my own a ticket. I will take care of my hotel accommodation. You only arrange for me my visa and you will not charge any entry fee for my talks. And I kept this policy. Maybe I'm doing it since the last, I think, 20 years, 2003, 2004. And when I attended conferences, I attended the GPO conference in London, I think it was in 2005. And that kept the lowest ticket was, about, I think, about 40 pounds, and they gave 50 pounds, 100 pounds. And if sitting next to me, they used to charge 200 pounds in the front row. 200 pounds in 2005, exorbitant. <coughs> But naturally, while going to a conference, there are many speakers, 10 speakers, 15 speakers, and you know, you cannot put conditions. Then I went to this conference in Canada in 2001, 2003, I think I attended twice or thrice, even they used to charge entry ticket. And that time, I could not tell people that, you know, you're having a conference and there are 30, 40 speakers, or not 30, there are 15 speakers, 10 speakers, 8 speakers, and there were expenses. And also, the last conference I remember I attended was the Journey of Faith in 2009. And then in 2010, I said that, inshallah, we should see to it that we break this trend. And we started having conferences in Bombay. The first conference we had in Bombay was in 2007. And I used to always admire, you know, the technology used by the Grammy Award, by the Oscar Award, the stage they used to have, the lighting they used to have. Haram! But the technology was great. It was impressive. So it was my desire at least to have one conference on a very high level, at least once in my lifetime. So mashallah, we invested something in the Islamic stocks and alhamdulillah we made a great profit. So we had in 2007 the first Islamic conference organized by the, our organization, Islamic Research Foundation, called the Peace, Con Peace Conference. Peace the solution of humanity. And at that time we called 20 speakers from different parts of the world. And every year we started having the conference. In 27, 2007, 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011. For five years we had. Once in English, then 2007 was in English, 2008 was in Urdu, 2009 was in English. In 2009 we called 30 English speakers from what 15 to 18 different countries and majority were from the western world and mashallah over 10 days there were a million people who attended it and we saw to it that we did not keep any ticket for it and this conference in terms of expense people always tell me you know you know why if you're having conference and their expenditures there you have to pay for tickets of five speaker ten speaker and ticket is expensive and then Hotel accommodation, so it costs money, you know? and I'm, yes, the expense is there. But we always believed that if you keep it free, the audience will be bigger. So the conference that I attended in GPU, it was about 25,000 people in, in one sitting for two days. So if you add up both, maybe maximum 50,000 people. I attended the risk conference again. Initially, the first year was less, three, 4,000, it increased. I attended the next one, 15,000. On a one, it was for two days or three days, all put together again less than 50,000. MashaAllah, here in 2009, we had a conference where the seating capacity in the last day was 250,000 in one sitting. And all the 10 days, more than a million people attended. And the cost of the conference, I know that ICNA and ISNA, when they have the conference, ICNA is in USA, the largest conference. I'm talking about all about a few years back, that before the COVID up to 2015, 16. Maximum they used to spend was $500,000. That's half a million dollars. I remember risk conference maybe 800,000 US dollars. 
now maybe a little bit more, but come the US dollar, somewhere close to that. Our conference in India, what we are in 2009, we spent $5 million, 10 times more than the second largest conference in the world. And it was absolutely free. There was no entry ticket. What you have to realize is that the Muslim Ummah is not that bad. There are surely people, if you give quality, you surely have donors who will come and support the cause. And though it was the most expensive conference in the world, where we spent $5 million, it was the cheapest in terms of cost effectiveness per person. Number one, when we did this conference, the main aim was so that the recording was of high quality. And majority of the cost was in, in recording. So when we did this conference, we used to have the conference from morning 10 till evening 10, 12 hours, taking the, taking the breaks away, at least nine hours of recording, nine hours of every day. So we used to start on a Friday and ended after 10 days on the next Sunday. And we thought to it that we called the Imams of the Haram. So we had Imam of Masjid Nabi, first we had the Sheikh Muhammad Ayyub, then Sheikh Salah Budir came, then Sheikh Saud Shirim came. And we had, mashallah, every year when we had the conference, we had two Imams, one from Masjid Nabi, one from Makkah. At one time, we even had from Masjid Aqsa. So we had the best of Qurras coming from all over the world. We didn't charge anything. And imagine a million people coming. Even live attendance, if you count, if we spend $5 million and 1 million people are attending it, so for, per person is $5 very cheap. But we fail to realize that on our satellite channel, there were 100 million people watching live. So people attending a million people, so $5 per person is very cheap. But the cost of the conference was including what we used to do outside the conference, where we had eight studios, where we used to record, we used to see to it that we make the best benefit of these people coming in the conference. So when 30 speakers come, that speaker comes on the stage over 10 days, maybe twice or thrice. The balance time, he's giving TV talks, they're having group discussion, they're having workshop, we're benefiting from the speaker. So simultaneously we have eight studios doing the recording. So much so that we used to record for thousands of hours for our peace TV. So the live telecast was there for 100 million and we used to record more than a thousand hours of the field in the studio, in eight studios, was phenomenal. So per person watching was just a couple of cents. 100 million people watching live and 5 million dollars spent is 20 cent per person. But 100 million, not one day, it's over 10 days. So per day, per person watching is less than a cent. So the volume and the reach was phenomenal. And I always believe that, imagine, if our sahabas started charging for the talks they gave, dawah they gave, would Islam would have reached us? Yeah, the answer is no. So I believe that dawah should always be free. I'm not saying charging is haram, but I wouldn't say it is recommended. And always, since the last 20 years, even for conferences, even today, anyone who calls me, my condition is you cannot charge. And that's the reason, mashallah, Allah has given more barakah. Even the conferences I attended now, what I attend now, all the conferences I attend, I do not allow anyone to charge. And even for my son, recently someone in Malaysia called my son, one of the universities, and they put a ticket of 10 ringgit. So my, I told my son, tell them, and they refunded the money back. Because charging per se is not haram, but I wouldn't think it is mustahab. So I personally feel that if you keep dawa free, it will benefit the ummah more. And what has happened now recently, in the last few years, it has become more of a business. The organizers, they organize the conference, they call the speakers, and it is even the fault of the dais, that nowadays in the western world, it has become a trend that most of the dais, they want a remuneration. They want money every time they come. If you don't give them a thousand dollar or two thousand dollar or some amount, they will not come. Many of the dais in the Western world, they ask, how much will you pay me? 
So only if you fulfill the requirement, they will come, otherwise they will not come. This is an unfortunate part. Alhamdulillah, yet, if you find the da'is in the other part of the world, they don't demand, mashallah. But naturally, when the organizers, when they call and if the da'i comes, it is good to give them some honorarium, no problem. But a da'i should not demand. Nowadays, I demand, I want a business class a ticket. And now, unfortunately, most of the famous dais, you have to give them business class ticket. And you, they, you have to give them in a five-star hotel. So the expenses go high. For me, mashallah, I always travel economic class. And whoever calls me, unless if it's the government who calls me at that time, I do not force that I will pay my ticket because I don't want to cross swords with the government. So suppose the government has called me, you know, I'm a, I'm a guest of the government. So at that time, I don't, I don't, I don't force and say. Anyways, I remember that one, a very big prince from Saudi Arabia had called me, but he was not from the government. I said, you have called me, I will come. They said, okay, we are booking your first class ticket. We are booking in the best hotel, Ritz Carlton. I said, sorry. I will come myself, I'll book my ticket. I told you I'll give you five hours, I will come to your palace for five hours and give the talk. So the thing is that I maintain that policy, and even now, never ever do we charge. Maybe hotel accommodation, suppose the organizers have got complimentary from the host, etc. that's a different question. But you see to it that we always book our own ticket, and I always travel in economic. Now that I cannot afford business class. Allah has blessed me, alhamdulillah, we can travel in business class, in first class, but I prefer spending that much money for the cause of dawah. Who wouldn't like the luxury of a business class or a, or a first class? But the more we sacrifice, Allah gives you more. So as a policy, from the last maybe 18 to 20 years, we have seen to it that we don't allow our organizers to charge any, any ticket for the. And I feel that most of the dai should do the same. Yes, there are some guys who don't charge, but the organizers call them and they make money because of them. That's a different thing. But they don't put their foot down. But I, as a policy, I put my foot down. If you want me, you cannot charge. And then I tell them, as far as the expenses is concerned, you can very well ask any donor, any Muslim donor, for donation, no problem. Then since the last 15 years, I've told anyone, if the organization is small, and there are times where a very small organization called me. So I have to tell them, you informed your Muslim brothers in your city that are calling Dr. Zakir and I can collect donation. And whatever shortfall is there, I will give you. And there have been so many occasions. There are organizers in Hyderabad, the budget was 5,000 rupees. That is 5,000 rupees is less than $100 a month. And they collected, mashallah, 20 lakh rupees at that time when they asked for donation. Imagine the budget per year is 50,000. They collected what is their budget for 40 years. What is the 40 years budget they collected for one event of mine? Alhamdulillah. I remember when I'm going to Korea, the, the youngsters, I told them, don't worry. Whatever thing, any shortage, I will give. And I told them, see, we will stay in a simple hotel. We'll, take, we'll be, have our own air ticket. Then we land and they have booked the five stars. What is this? You said you're in a budget. Why are you booking five stars? I said, no, there is a Muslim donor who came. And he said, Dr. Zakir Naik is coming. You have to put them in five star hotel. So this is the barka from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what we find that if you don't keep tickets, the, the numbers are bigger. That is the reason you find that most of these conferences that you have, the audience is limited. Yes, if you have in America, you'll have 15,000. That's it. Why not more? 15,000 in one sitting, the other conference is that there, maybe 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, why? Why don't you have 100,000? Why don't you have 200,000? Why not? So the thing is there that nowadays, organizing lectures of diet has become a business for many organizations. And they make money, it's not haram. I don't think, I'm not saying it's haram. It's better do business and get people close to Allah, then do other business. But I feel it's preferable if you keep it free, your sawab will be more. You make an organization rather than a business company, 
in that organization take donation you can take your salary for what you are what time you are giving there is no harm at all and see to it that you give more benefit for the ummah so because of this alhamdulillah this policy mashallah i personally prefer that but in india and the eastern and and the eastern part of the world you don't have all the lectures where people are charging now they have started they are having workshop where people are start charging where they have been bombay but previously it was unheard of so they are emulating from the western world even malaysia where i live most of the lectures are charged but alhamdulillah i am coming in malaysia since 1996 1996 till today 2023 never any event in malaysia have anyone paid a single ringgit here and i have given talks in 1996 when i used to come the audience for a few thousand then it increased in 2012 it became tens of thousand in 2016 i gave a talk in bukit jalil stadium more than 50000 in 2019 in klantana gave a talk more than 100000 people not a single ticket charged i went to indonesia 110000 people came mashallah so we see to it that we tell the organizers please don't charge any money you can always ask the people and if any shortfall we'll pay and believe me in all these 20 years i did not give a single dollar to any organization why they always collected more than what they spent even in malaysia in malaysia when i came in 2016 the organizer told us it will cost us 200000 ringgit to keep your lecture in the stadium the stadium is given free by the government i said collect from the muslims of malaysia whatever shortfall i will give i was prepared maximum they collect is zero i will give them 200000 why charge mashallah they collected 450000 ringgit can you believe they had 250000 ringgit excess so never ever in my life had there been a single event where the organizers collected money and they fell short for the requirement so if you follow the same policy allah subhanahu wa taala surely going to help you and surely the muslim umma here in the world they aren't that bad that they wouldn't want to see but unfortunately this trend has started from the western world there was sort of an organization which started charging and this has continued and it is taken precedence so i personally prefer that the dawa talks the dawa conferences the dawa event absolutely free and believe me we do bigger event the expenditure is multiple time more than all these people that charge ticket okay have an event you give your shops on rent where people sell islam because it's no problem that have no objection with that we won't bother also with much of those we had we had a good halal expo in bombay but that was another main thing our main thing was quality and we have to have exhibition you know it was and but match there in bombay when we did the conference mashallah our staff was other only 500 we try 1000 employee we have to have 4000 volunteers so only a volunteer force is bigger than the audience of the conferences to handle such a large audience so allah help us so if you do with the class if we do with the pure nia so that is the reason a policy that we never charge for any of the islamic lectures when we go we tell them that we will i don't of course we don't expect every day to bear his own etiquette they cannot so it's the role it's the duty of the organizers to to see to it that they give them a ticket and I always request that is that please don't demand for a business class the cost of a business class ticket is very expensive it is 5 to 6 times the cost of economic ticket in most parts of the world if you can save this cost and keep the speaker in a very good hotel no problem i always say that and in our a policy was very straight when we called the speakers we used to give economic class ticket if some there were only one or two who really requested so the answer went from my manager dr zakir naik also travels in economic class finish not that we could not afford business class but imagine 30 people we are giving business class ticket you know a normal ticket will cost you how much will cost you about 2 3000 dollars if you business class ticket multiply by 6 time 20000 dollars 18000 dollars one multiply by 30 people what will be the cost even if you can afford we should not encourage it so we always have a policy 
Yes, if the government calls you and the government is giving you, we cannot object. So if the government calls and if they are giving you, what can we do? So we kept this policy and mashallah, Allah gave barka, the work increased and the audience is increasing, alhamdulillah. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may most of the duas, whether in English language, Urdu, Bangla language, any other language, see to it that they maintain this policy so that the work will spread. And inshallah, we as Da'is get more sawab in this world and the akhirah. The next question. Assalamu alaikum. My best teacher, Dr. Zakir Naik. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi My name is Muhammad Bilal Danish from Pakistan district. Bajaur. I am your big fan all the time at school, college, university and madrasa. Alhamdulillah. I have seen you twice or thrice in dreams. One of my friend Abbas told you in my dreams that who are you and you replied with a smile that I am a Muslim. He again and again asked the same question and you replied the same answer. I get very pleased with the simple name title that people called himself Muslim, instead of Hanafi, Shafi, etc. I am a student of DVM, Doctor of Veterinary and Medicine. My question is, how can I utilize my time life to give the message of Islam to the people who are Muslims or non-Muslims? May Allah make me meet you in this world as well as in the hereafter, in Janat Firdos, in neighborhood of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and all the sahabas. The brother has basically asked a question. He is a veterinary doctor and he says how can he spend his time and life in trying to give the message of Islam to Muslims and non-Muslims. And I started the talk, this program, with the eye of the Quran from Surah Fusilat, chapter number 41, verse number 33, Allah says, وَمَنْ أَحَسَنْ يُقَالَ مِمَّنْ ضَوَيْلَ اللَّهِ وَعَمِلُ صَالِحَوْنَ وَقَالَ إِنَّ الْمِلْمُسْلِمِينَ Who is better in speech than one who invites to the way of thy Lord? Works righteousness and says that I'm a Muslim. So according to the verse of the Quran, the best profession is that of a da'i. Who is better in speech than one who invites to the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So the best profession, better than any other profession, is the profession of a da'i. Regarding the question, that how can I spend my time calling people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now as you said that you have already done your doctorate of veterinary medicine, of uh, uh, veterinary medicine, that you are doctor of the animals. So as far as Dawah is concerned, it is further than every Muslim. What you can do is that depending upon your age, depending upon what is how much time you have if you have the time where you can join an islamic university and learn arabic as a language that's the best learning arabic as a language and joining islamic university like islamic university in Medina or jamat al-imam in riyadh is the best so that you can be you may know the basic knowledge of the deen and then come to dawah if that's difficult then very well you can take the help of the social media, whether it be YouTube or you can go on our platform, Alidaya platform. Alidaya is the largest Islamic video library in the world, having thousands of hours of video and has more than 40 Islamic speakers of the world. So if you enroll yourself on the Alidaya platform, it's absolutely free, the basic version is free. If you want a higher version of high definition of 4K, then you have to pay a monthly fee or annual fee. Otherwise, the basic version is free. And if you go, it has two sections. One is the video on demand, and the other are the Islamic courses. And in, in the Islamic course, in my section, there is a training program called as a Dawa training program. Let's become effective dais. So in this section, let's become effective dais. There's a dawa training program where I've done a training program where I train a person how to be a dai. That how you should quote the Quran, quote the Hadith, what are the things important, 
it's more of a technique based program how you should give a speech your modulation your eye to eye contact your gestures as far as knowledge is concerned there are thousands of pages of notes there on verses of the quran that are important hadith that are important the biblical verses that are important the scriptures of the hindus the vedas the bhagavad gita so it is a comprehensive course the original course was for 33 days online depending upon how much time and how much time is at your disposal if you give every day 8 hours you may finish in few months if you give half a day it may take more than a year to finish the course if you are giving 2 hours a day it will take a few years for you to to complete the course and every month we are leaving uh courses and besides that there are various other courses available on on different topics so if you can make use of alida platform attend these courses see the videos of myself and 40 other authentic speakers from all over the world this will be a good good source of knowledge and surely when you whatever you learn from the social media platform or from alida platform see to it that you implement it and go and speak to your friends whatever you learn you memorize it and implement it inshallah allah will give you more knowledge and there cannot be a better profession than that of a dai and the more you keep on involving yourself to talk to your non muslim friend you may not be very knowledgeable you start whatever you learn you convey allah will give you more knowledge and the more you learn the more you the more you know the more you realize you don't know so knowledge is a wealth which is which is unlimited you start you put it into practice start conveying the message and you see the difference inshallah hope that answers the question another question assalamu alaikum sir wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh i am tas tasnim huda bangladesh a student i would request you to give a lecture or a session on how to do business giving minimum time cause it will help many dais in bangladesh as they as here to be a full time dai is not very easy task it is very difficult to do a job and give more than 50% of time to dawa please answer my question i have been texting for 2 years but didn't get a reply brother tasneem from bangladesh wants me to give a lecture on how to do business so that people can learn to do business and they can do business and dawa together it is like someone asking me that i have got multiple denomination of notes i have notes of 1 rupee 5 rupee 10 rupee 100 rupee 500 rupee 1000 rupee 2000 rupee i am distributing notes of 2000 or saying zakir why don't you distribute 1 rupee note it is absurd that i am giving talks on dawa the benefit of dawa is unlimited you are telling me to leave my dawa and give a talk how to do business my advice to the muslim brothers and sisters if you want to be a dai you and you want to do business in dawa please don't do i would advise you if you have learned how to do dawa utilize your skills every minute what you have learned of dawa to do dawa not business today in the world there are millions of businessmen how many not hundreds not thousands not 10000 millions for me according to me a dai who's on the straight path on quran and hadith the lowest among the thousands of dai that are there is better than the most successful businessman of the world according to me a dai who is preaching quran and sunnah on the authentic path is far superior to bill gates even even to jeff bezos or even to tesla on elon musk for me a dai who is the lowest amongst all the dais in the world as long as in quran and sunnah for me is more valuable than elon musk 
Have you got the answer? Because in my previous answer I said, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Fusilla, chapter 41, verse number 33, وَمَنْ أَحَسُنُ قَوْلَ مِمَّنْ ضَوْا إِلَى اللَّهِ وَعَمِلُ صَالِحًا وَقَالَ إِنَّ الْمُسْلِمِينَ Who is better in speech than one who invites people to the way of their Lord? Who works such as this and says that I'm a Muslim. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that the person who Allah loves, he gives him the knowledge of the understanding of the deen. I like to repeat, a beloved prophet said, the person who Allah loves, he gives him the understanding of the deen. He doesn't give him wealth. And Allah gives wealth to everyone, good and bad people both. The wealth, so many kafirs have got wealth. So many non-Muslims have got wealth. So wealth is not something which is to be craved for. What is to be craved by a Muslim is deen. The knowledge of the deen and the understanding of the deen, not money. There are thousands of courses on how to become a businessman. Why do you want me to come down from the level of distributing 2000 rupees, distribute 1 rupee, why? Maybe you have a misconception. Yes, you may have heard that Dr. Zakir Naik, mashallah. Allah has blessed me. I do business as a part-time. And I've told that even in my talk on Dr. Zakir history. And I've said that, yes, I spend a few hours a week, maybe two days in a month, or a few weeks in a year for my business, and Allah has blessed me. Alhamdulillah. Allah has given me that. Like among the Sabahs, we know that Abdurrahman bin Auf, may Allah be pleased with him. There's a saying that whatever he touched became gold. He was expert in business. Expert in business. When he did Hijrah and when he went to Medina, you know the Ansar they gave what the Muhajir want they gave. What do you want take? He said, I want nothing. Only show me the place to the market. And he goes there and he comes back with many goods. Allah had given him the art of business. There was a saying, whatever he touched became gold. But when he went to teach people, did he teach business to the people? No. He taught Islam. Do you think he'll enter Jannah because he was a good businessman? No. So you have to understand that money is not the main criteria. Amongst all the important things, the least important is money. Because if I teach someone to do business and he starts making money. Do you think I'll get sawab? Most of the people will stop dawa. The dai when he learns how to do business. You know, many a times a beloved Prophet ﷺ said, I don't fear poverty for my ummah, I fear wealth. Because if a person is poor, he's more on the straight path. It's more difficult for a rich man to go to Jannah than a poor man. That's what a Prophet said. And we see the history of the sahabas at the time of the Prophet. Did the Prophet leave behind wealth? Did he leave behind gold? What did he leave behind? He left behind Sahabas. And we know the incidents. Hazrat Umar may Allah be pleased with him. When he was Amir al when he was the Khalifa, he asked the Sahabas that what would you ask Allah? What would you pray to Allah to fill this room with so that you could spend it in the way of Allah? So one Sahaba gets up and says, I would pray to Allah to let this room be filled up with gold. Hazrat so Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, says, ask for something better. So another Sahaba gets up and says, I will ask Allah, I will pray to Allah to let this room be filled up with rubies and jewels so that I could spend in the way of Allah. Not on themselves, huh? in the way of Allah. Hazrat Umar says, ask for something better. So they say, Ya Amirul Mu'minin, you say what is better. So he says, I will pray to Allah to let this room be filled with du'ats, like Mu'az ibn Jabal. Abdul Rahman went off. So that I could send them to spread the deen of Allah. See? He never asked for gold, never asked for money, he asked for manpower. So I'm giving people training how to become da'is, you are telling me to give training how to become businessman. This is the problem. Our deen is very simple. 
and I always tell there are many of my students see Allah has blessed me alhamdulillah and I'm very thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that organization started it was mainly funded by my father for the initial few years and 95% was funded by the family then when the budget became big others started funding as far as my thing is concerned my, my parents told me I don't have to worry about my living they'll take care of it within a couple of years I started doing business and Allah blessed me we did hijra we left behind millions and hundred million dollars mashallah nothing we started again Allah has blessed us again so this is Allah's niyama but I've told many of my students many of my students you know start doing the okay now we'll make business with dawa we start the organization do business we'll do this we'll do that and they collected money from outside I would them, don't do that you collect money for donation do the work no problem if you collect money for business and you promise them you'll give a profit and you cannot do your reputation will be ruined and believe me there were some of my very good students in Bombay and in Malaysia who did not heed to my advice in Bombay also they thought you know they will make okay and then what I'll do then yeah maybe good they're good people they were not cheat they were very honest but they were not businessmen one of my students in Bombay collected crores of rupees and what happened then he came to me I'm waiting for the day where I can walk on this earth without any debt on my head good guy honest person not a cheat but not a businessman so why are you shifting from your dawa to business the people come and I train them in dawa and then they, I said Baba I trained you in dawa correct I trained you free right now you want to shift from dawa to become a businessman so why did you come for my training you let the businessmen do business let them fund you no problem the moment you show your ability of dawa there will be surely people coming and taking care of you yes that's an option I give that if Allah has given you the knack and you're coming from a family which is there I, I do not come from with this family but Allah gave me that Alhamdulillah so my advice is please don't ever venture into doing business high chances you lose number one according to me 95 percent you will lose this is average you start doing business you lose why simply take the risk and even if you make money five percent time i know some guys who are doing business they start making money now they're not doing dawa i won't name them popular guys mashallah famous in the world maybe in the second third level they start doing business they started making so much money that they stopped doing dawa. Now they may give lecture once a year. That's it. This is what happens. So 95% chance you lose. And 5% chance if you make money, 95% times if you make money out of that 5%, you lose dawa. You'll get so much impressed with money that you'll shift towards businessman and leave your dawa. So you want me to take you from the good path to the wrong path? I'll never do that. I will never. I always advise my students and my audience, please, please, see to it that you concentrate on dawa. I tell my son, I don't want you to be a businessman. I will see to it that I will make a business in which you will be able to survive. By you becoming a dai is more important. And I'm happy that he learned dawa. Even if he learns to become a good businessman and runs the business and makes profit, it's nothing compared to the profit he will get by doing dawah the benefit that you get in this world and the akhira by doing dawah is phenomenal and believe me even when you earn money I tell you to die once you start to earn money see to it that the majority of your earnings you give it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and if you do business one of the secrets of business of my business is that you make Allah your partner and when you make Allah a partner in business, you can't make him a small partner. You have to minimum give 51% of your profit. Now, how many Muslims have the heart to give 51%? Most of the Muslims don't even give two and a half percent zakat. What they have to give? I told my son, when he starts business, minimum 51% you should give in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in charity. Nothing less than that. You cannot make Allah a lesser partner in your business. And then keep on increasing as much as you can. So my style of business is different. 
you require a hat. And if I tell a person, okay, you may be earning even thousand dollars, will you give fifty one percent in charity? How many will agree? Oh, I require five thousand dollars. I am earning thousand dollars. How can I give charity? So first, you should know how to sacrifice. So my style of business is different. When my style of business is different, so therefore I don't want to teach anyone to do business. I want to teach people to dawa. I inspire them through dawa. And this question itself is, it's a misconception that you have. And believe me, that Allah has given me success in the business is because of my dawa. It is not that my dawa is successful because of the money I have. It is opposite. Because I'm successful in business, because I have sacrificed my life for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is nothing. What we have done is nothing, not even 0.001% and Allah does million times more than what we have done. So my request to the Dai is, please don't indulge. If you have a running business of your parent and if you can do it, Alhamdulillah. Better is make a box. If parent has money, okay, buy a, some property, we are getting monthly rent for Utilizing the monthly rent, there is no business policy required. It is safe. Handling a business requires time, requires risk. Many drawbacks are there and high chances that you will deviate and stop your dawa and get involved in business only. So don't concentrate on that. A dai, what you should do, my request to you brothers and sisters is that see to it that you make your requirements in this world less. Once you make the requirement of your living style very simple then your requirements will be less your demand will be less you can concentrate more on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala see to it that you're simple and and I've told that many a times that you should lead a simple life and here also I tell people that for me and my wife to live we require only 2000 ringgit that's it about 450 dollars nothing if you want to rent an apartment, you can add another, another 2,000 ringgit, maximum 1,000 dollars. So according to me, you can live in any part of the world, not counting the rent of the apartment. If 500 dollars is required in Malaysia, I feel a Dai can survive easily, he and his wife, not the big family, easily for 1,000 dollars anywhere in the world, not counting the rent of the apartment, please note that. For Dawa, what you require is different. You may ask from the Dawa organization. So see to it that you make your requirement less. I know what I'm talking. If you see what is the normal minimum requirement in Malaysia, it may be more than what I'm talking about. <laughs> so make your requirements less. What is the average requirement in America for American to live? Your requirement should be less than that. And it's possible. Make your requirements less. Once your requirements are less, no one can twist your arm. No one can force you to think what you don't want. If money comes, give in charity. Money comes, spend on dawa. Spend on your ticket. Spend on your flying. Spend on the other things. This is the best formula. So see to it that you have your requirements less. And see to it that you join the dawa organization. If you say, no, my demands are so and so, I want so much salary, therefore I cannot join the Muslim organization, then this is your drawback. Make your requirements less. If your requirements are less, you can do a job or do a part-time job. Do a part-time job, earn less, your requirements are less. Do half the one, no problem. You want to do part-time business, man, do part-time job. And you may think that the salary is less. Make your requirements. If for me, $500 is less in Malaysia and Bangladesh. It can be much less. Much less. For a person to live. So see to it that your requirements are less and concentrate on techniques of dawa and how we improve your dawa rather than learn how to become a businessman. Hope this answers the question. This was the last question that we could handle in the limited time we have. Till we meet, inshallah, next Saturday. Assalamu alaikum. Warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Wa akhirul dawana dhillar bilalim.